Thank you. The beneficiaries. So we'll try and think about this big word. Uh, it says a big mouthful, you know. Uh, it's really thinking about those who benefit, uh, you know, the benefits. And who are the beneficiaries uh, is be the great question, you know. Who prophesied and searched? Well, of course, we've had those, the reading from the Old Testament, and we're reminded that Isaiah was one man who prophesied and searched for it and thought about it. He didn't just write down a willy-nilly what things came to his mind. He was directed to write it down, of course, as we had seen at some other times, but he searched diligently into these things. They thought about it. Uh, all those different prophets in the past, he's one man we just pick out of all of them. And he's one that has been really directed to, to graphically uh, show the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that would happen and what it means to us who are the real beneficiaries of uh, uh, the will of our elder brother. So, so who testified? You know, well, that's an interesting question for us to think about in the, in the study. Who testified? You know, right. And then who are the reporters? Who's reporting it? And that's another question to think about. Who would ever be the reporters? Who would be the, the ones who are, who are uh, bringing the news? Uh, to, uh, to to people, the initial the initial reporters, right? So the beneficiaries. Well, let's think first of all. The spirit reveals, and then uh, secondly, the the prophets relate. Maybe I'm giving you some clues now, and the apostles report. And fourthly, the readers receive. Maybe they are surely recipients, huh? Right. So the Spirit reveals in 1 Peter 1.11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So who is the Spirit of Christ, I suppose we might ask? Well, that is, of course, the Holy Spirit uh, that is uh, directing there and uh, guiding. And uh, they were guided by God, the Holy Spirit, even in the time of the Old Testament, the Old Testament writers were guided and directed to write by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it says the Lord, of course, speaking, he was speaking on behalf of the Lord. Uh, and he testified, you see. It's his testimony. And so wonderful. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, the writers just writing it down, but it was the Spirit of Christ who was in, the, in them. And he was, this Holy Spirit was in. So there were believers. Uh, Isaiah and Moses, and all the other ones that wrote, you know, the minor prophets, you know, the Holy Spirit was in them. That was amazing, wasn't it? In other words, there were saved men, there were believers. He testified beforehand, in and through them, and they spoke it all out, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. And there was none like it that spoke about it so much as uh, Isaiah. Uh, and then, of course, Zechariah, he talks about him being, uh, you know, that look at him being pierced and, and uh, different, different things there, you know. And David, uh, of course, uh, speaks about it too in, in the Psalms, about his uh, sufferings and crucifixion. Who is the Spirit of Christ? That's quite something, you know. You know, yes, of course, he's, he, he's endowed with, the, with the, the Spirit of God, you know. 
but uh, uh, Christ, but uh, the, the Spirit of Christ here is relating to the Holy Spirit. Who is he? Testified. Yeah. Right. So in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, we have this uh, uh, here where we have looked at before. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of men, man, but holy men of God, there were holy men of God now, marked that, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guiding them and directing them. And that is how we understand who the Spirit of Christ is. This is the prophet's scriptorium. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, it was revealed they had a great scriptorium where all the writings were done, you know. Now, this, the prophets wouldn't have anything like that. Uh, they maybe wrote in all kinds of places, you know. Uh, they wouldn't have had the, that much, but they still wrote. They had to write it down uh, they, uh, uh, on their scrolls. Right? They are inquiring, verse 10. Very much requiring, inquiring and thinking and looking into it uh, and search carefully. So it's very painstaking, very thoughtful, very concerned of what they're writing and what they're doing because, but yet, they're guided and directed to do it by the Holy Spirit. They had to put down only what the Holy Spirit of God told them to write. Even the time. To whom. Time to whom these things were, were pointing. You know. And of course that was the problem. And they weren't, they weren't really particularly able. Were they? Were they able to? Well, we have an indication, and uh, we wouldn't be, you know, we hoping you see this can be, but in Daniel 9.25, Know therefore, and understand that, that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, even as I mentioned there, you see, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks the streets will be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. It had to be, it was pulled down by the uh, Babylonians and then to be rebuilt then again by the decree of Cyrus. And it was going to, in very difficult times, it was rebuilt again. Herod, of course, Herod the Great, he, he finished it. He thought he'd get a great name for himself as this great architect and builder. Right. The Holy Spirit was in them. That's important, you see, for us to understand. You know, right? The Holy Spirit was indicating these prophecies. You know, they were uh, guided to write it through their mind and their heart. Uh, and it was uh, kind of like a verbal uh, dictation verbally uh, given to them, but it had to come through their mind and heart, personally and individually. They thought it and they wrote it down. And they have it for us now, today. They searched within their abilities. All of them had their different abilities, their, their different vocabularies and understandings and uh, and uh, all that you see and God worked through these the Holy Spirit used these you know to bring out the real word of God and to bring out particularly the coming the, the pointing to the time and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ even one of them talked about him being born as we mentioned already in Bethlehem of Judea, Bethlehem of Frata. 
you know, the old name, Ephrata. Right. What did the Holy Spirit testify to them? Well, of course, we're getting a great clues, aren't we? Right? In Isaiah 53, 5, a wonderful uh, read there to us, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, that is God the Father, laid on him, that is Jesus Christ, God's Son, the iniquity of us all. We're not surprised, you see, that a great man called, a counselor called, and pastor now Richard Gans, when he heard that, he says, what are you reading that to me? He says, I'm a Jew. I don't, uh, I don't follow the New Testament. And then the, he gave the Bible to him and he got the shock of his life. He was there converted on the spot because there it was, the reading in his own Hebrew Bible that he never knew. You know, he knew about the Bible, yes, the Hebrew Bible, but he didn't know it, it was there. And the glorification of Christ then, you know, as Peter mentions, he was glorified. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered, what? With the transgressors. So wonderful. And he bore the sin of money and made intercession for the transgressors. That he's praying for us, the beneficiaries of this great event. Right at the, father, at the right hand of the Father in heaven for you and for me. And he's reminded, we're reminded, in past then, you see, that he would make intercession. Something, some of those things, they, the prophets would find it very hard to get their head around and understand, but they had to write it down because they were directed by the Holy Spirit within them. The prophets relate. You see, the prophet, that's their job, to relate it. To tell it. That is the Old Testament preaching of Christ. And there is none better preaching of the gospel than in Isaiah 53. And so you get a, a real understanding of now as it has improved on the preaching of the gospel in the Old Testament. I mean, it's a great evangelist is Isaiah, you know. But it's the preaching of Christ. It's presenting Christ. And it's Christ who saves. But they could only look forward to Christ coming. We can look back to that time again. You know, but there we're looking forward in belief and trust. Too. In chapter 318, we come to... Noah preached Christ to the spirits in prison. In the prison house of sin, really. There to the people as he was putting the pegs into the, the ark and putting the wood together and cutting it and putting it, splitting it or whatever way it was done and put together. He was preaching Christ to them. That's what uh, Peter, of course, reminds us. And they were, but they were in the prison house of sin. They were, the, the veil was over them. They were blackened, they were darkened. Mm. And they needed their eyes opened. And of course, they were so blind that there was only the eight and the ark that believed and followed it. Listen to the story. Listen to the message, you know. Right. They were to relate. For us only. They were to relate it for us only. You know, uh, 
It was at Christ that it was Christ's first advent, Christ's first coming into the world and all about him, as much as they were told. Right? That's as far as they could go. That's what they could do. But they believed it because there were men. The Holy Spirit was in them. Right? Now, what happens after that? The apostles report. They're the reporters then. Uh, they're the uh, ones who's going to tell the message, you know. Uh, right. 1 Peter 1.12, to whom it was revealed that not to themselves. <laughs> they couldn't understand, take it in. It wasn't for them. This wasn't going to happen then in their day, in the prophet's day. But now it's happening in the, the apostles' day. But to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And it's things, dot, dot, things, which angels desire to look into. They'd like to understand it, know about it, but they, they're not, it's not planned by God for them to know more about it. They're messengers and they're, <clears throat> they can just do what God shows and tells them what to do. That's all they can do. You know, but the apostles were the, next, the first reporters of it. You know. Right. It was quite a story to bring out, especially, you know, at uh, uh, Pentecost. Yeah. When the Holy Spirit came down on them, especially for the first time. And so we go on to see the readers receive. Who are the readers then? Well, there's the, maybe you could have said the listeners and the readers. There was, when it was put down in, in, in print then, in, in book form or in, in manuscript form, they had letters that passed from one church to the other, of course, so the readers receive it. Yeah. This is a letter or an epistle that uh, Peter wrote. We are the beneficiaries then. It's for us. What amazing, that God in his great love and mercy should provide it this way, and he wanted that we have it in this 21st century, that we have it today in our hand, the Bible in our lap, in our hands, on the screen, wherever it might be, still the word of God doesn't change. We are the beneficiaries, and the blessing it is for us is you know, amazing. It's, it's beyond all thinking, isn't it? To take it in, think about it. Like the prophets of old too as well, they were shaken by it, I'm sure. We hold the whole word of God in our hands. They couldn't have it. But we have the complete word of God and we're not to add to or take away from it. There it is, in its entirety, you know. And that's so wonderful, so great. We have the gospel of Christ in it, you see, to us. The saving news, good news. And it's the gospel that's the good news of salvation for us all. How amazing, how wonderful. But it is, you know, regardless of the whole words, the 66 books of the Bible is there, <coughs> excuse me, presenting Christ to us. And salvation is only in him, for there's salvation in none other, for there's no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. It's the gospel of the kingdom. I thought about that. Hear the call of the kingdom. Lift your eyes to the king. Lift your eyes to the king, you know. 
So wonderful, you see, you know. He's the king. He's the kingdom. And he's got people. Then you trust him, follow him. All the great ones that will be following him with him. And the final challenge then is verses uh, 13 to 16. Right? Verse 13. It says there, girding your mind. That might be a hard word to get your, your head around. Uh, girding your mind. You know, it's got the idea of a girdle. Maybe men don't wear girdles. But in the past days, they did. You had, they had a flowing robe, you see. And they would have you know, we think about there in uh, Ephesians, the, the belt, uh, you know, the belt of, uh, of truth. And here, this is the same idea, the belt or a girdle around their waist. And that was normally there, and they would have a flowing kind of robe, you know. And one man came to our stall when we used to have the market stall, and he asked me for a robe. I thought for a minute, that, oh yeah, maybe I mean a jacket. We have jackets, all right. <laughs> I don't have rooms so much for men, you know. <laughs> but anyway, but there it is, you see. So this, this, this girdle, you see, this, this, uh, uh, to girdle, you see, would would be tied round. And you see, if if uh, a person at that time wanted to do work, or wanted to run, or wanted to do something, uh, these flowing, these long tails would get in their way and trip them up, maybe. And so it had to be tucked up in the, they would tuck it up in the, in the girdle, in the belt. Mm. Uh, you know, a few places around it there, they would, they would tuck it up, you see, in there, you see. Uh, and that would save them tripping up. And it's talking here about girding, what is it? Your, your mind. Verse 13. Therefore, gird up the lines of your mind. You know, not just the lines, your lines was round about your, your tummy, you know, there you see, but the lines of your mind. And so you had to take care of it. The mind is, is, is something that's very, uh, you know, can be uh, affected, you know. The old enemy will, will hit the mind. We, we have the helmet of salvation it talks about too, and that was to protect the head against any arrow or anything that would hit it, you see. Now our minds have to protect it, you see, against the attack of the enemy. It's protection. And so that's important. And here you see, um, this again is another way that there, Peter is putting it, to, to gird up the lines of your mind. You know, I think it's important to think about that uh, and that it has to be, your minds have to be protected. The mind can let you run riot, you know, say, think things and uh, waste time and all sorts of things that can go on about, you know. Even men, wore a girdle and a long flowing robe. But they, they were able to tuck it up and tidy it up, you know, that it, you know. And we are minds have to be tidied up uh, and so as it'll be, uh, uh, will not be tripped up, will not be tripped up in our thinking. Wrong thoughts and anything like that, you know, just in case. Right, doing certain jobs, they would tuck the tail up into the girdle of the belt. Right. Matthew Henry says, be sober, be virtual against all spiritual dangers and enemies, and be temperate in all behavior. Be sober-minded in opinion. And then they finally say, and humble. Yeah, the way you go. Right. Live then in the light of the return of Christ, you know, because he's coming again. 
holiness to the Lord. Verse 16. Right. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct. Quote from Leviticus 11, uh, 44 and 45, and chapter 19, verse 2, and 20, verse 7. So the book, that is the highlighting verse of the book of healing. Uh, of Leviticus, this may be a difficult one with all the sacrifices, and yet, it was holiness to the Lord. Be holy, for I am holy. You know, that was quite something, wasn't it? For them. Why did he say that, you know? Well, really, it's the example I heard of the carrot for the donkey. What did they do with the donkey? The donkey, they're a funny animal, you know, a donkey, to get them to do things. And if they had a load, you know, uh, they might refuse to, to go budge and bring it. We you know what they've done. They got, had a carrot. And they, hold, they held the carrot all the way to where they were taking the, the load of stuff to before the donkey's nose. And the donkey would be going for it, you see, all the time, grabbing it. But they would make sure to keep it away from him until he, they arrived. And then they would give the donkey the carrot. He loved that, you know. He was going for that. Now here is the carrot. Be holy, for I am holy. You know, as to follow the Lord. We are asked to be more like Jesus, to follow him. To follow him uh, day by day and to seek his way and his will. And, you know, if you obey me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. And that's a big statement there, you know. Uh, I hear uh, uh, one man is telling me about, oh, yeah, if you keep the law, you're fine, you know. But, you know, the law shows us our sin. And the law shows us and, and points us to Christ, who's kept it perfectly. And he's the one who will help us in all that, you know. And so that's the great thing, you know. It's a holiness to the Lord who's finishing here in this particular. The beneficiaries then, 1 Peter 1 11, he, he, the Holy Spirit, testified beforehand, way before it all, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. What a testimony this was to them, to show them and to prepare them and help them to write it down. Word for word, as dictated and directed, through their minds and hearts, more than a dictation, you know, they had to take it in, and maybe you don't like the term, regurgitate it. Chew it over. You know, an animal has to regurgitate the food. The food comes up, and then it's chewed over again, and then it travels back down. So often I've watched these animals sitting quite calmly, and they're chewing the cud. And, 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 and they chew away, and nothing comes out, you know, they have, when they're good and healthy, they knock them out, chew away, and they swallow it. And then you see another coming back up the throat again, and then they chew away on that, you see. And they're, what is happening? They're taking all the nutrition and all the benefits out of the out, out of the, the food, the grass and the food and the meal and everything they have got. And so that's the same for us, you see, in the word of God, as we take out the nutrients and the blessings uh, and the benefits for us there. Because they're all coming from heaven itself. Let's pray. Our gracious and our mighty God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your precious word that came to us, to men of old, the prophets of old, you know, these ancient men wrote. And we pray, Lord, your blessing now. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake and glory. Amen. Righto.